Hi, this is Mike Brown, owner of Death Wish Coffee Company. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. I love Java, Death Wish Coffee presents Fueled by Deathcast, the world's strongest podcast. With your hosts, the incredible Jeff and the amazing D Man. Welcome, everybody, to Fueled by Deathcast. This is a really, really special episode. This is episode 82, and we're titling this one From the Basement to the Cosmos because this is going to be our recap of everything that went on with the launch of the rocket that contained Death Wish Coffee that is now orbiting the Earth in the International Space Station. Uh, I just want to start by saying, as always, I am the Incredible Jeff. And I am the Amazing D-Man. And if you guys would like to follow us on social media, we'd love for you if you did. Our social media of choice is Instagram, uh, but you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. It's very easy. I am at Jeff Wish Coffee. And I am at Death Wish Dustin. It's that easy. And if you're just listening to this episode on your favorite podcast listening device, whether it be iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Music, or any of those in between, uh, we are also a video podcast. And this one is the one you really want to watch because this is a ton of footage of my trip down to NASA. And you're going to want to see it as much as you're going to want to hear it. Every single week, we not only release this podcast in audio format, but video as well. And you can find all of that on the Death Wish Coffee Company YouTube page. And finally, I want to thank our good friend, Brock Powell. BrockVox.com. He is the voice actor behind all the voices on this show and a thousand other in the world. We cannot thank him enough. Fueled by Deathcast, Fueled by Death Show would be nothing without Brock Powell. And uh, we love him to the moon and back. Let's try to thank him enough. Yes. Thank you, 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 thank you. Oh, no, I fell apart. I couldn't do it. It's It was close. It was close. Um, So this episode is really special. It's going to be a little bit different format that we normally do. Normally, we have a guest on every single week. But uh, we have been on a year-long journey now that we didn't even know we were on in the beginning. Uh, Those are all the best journeys, right? You don't know you're on a journey until it starts to, like, really pick up and you're like, oh my God, this is a thing. Yeah. And then it happens and you don't even, you can't even really take it all in. You're like, I, it's, it's a thing that I never could believe happens and it's happening and I still don't believe it. It's, it's, and in, it still hasn't soaked in, Jeff. It still hasn't, I was just about to say, it still hasn't sunk in for me either um, that our coffee is now being I'm drank the, by astronauts in outer fucking space, dude. It is the truth. Dude. And for all of <laughs> the new listeners and viewers out there, I want to take a little bit of time in the very beginning here to welcome you to the show if this is your first time watching or listening, and also welcome you to Death Wish, Death Wish Coffee Company. Uh, if you don't know, Death Wish Coffee is the world's strongest coffee. Now, I guess we can say we're the strongest coffee in the galaxy, which is a pretty fun thing yeah. to say out loud. Oh, wait, Jeff, can you answer the question? What, what makes it the world's strongest coffee? What makes us the world's strongest coffee? We get that all the time. Basically, what it is is we use a blend of Arabica and Robusta beans, and it's the way that we blend the beans, and it's also the way that we roast the beans, depending on the temperature, the different chemical composition, the way we blend them together to make the best-tasting cup of the world's strongest strongest coffee and again if you don't know back in 2011 this was just an idea by our founder and owner mike brown he he was part owner of a coffee shop here in upstate new york in saratoga springs new york and he wanted to provide his customers with the best tasting strong cup of coffee and thus bore the idea of death wish coffee and we have done some pretty incredible stuff since then we've been on good morning america we won the intuit quickbooks small business big game contest of over 15,000 small businesses and we won a Super Bowl commercial in Super Bowl 50 which was absolutely incredible we've sponsored some incredible um events out there too NASCAR yep. Poker Central yep. we were the official coffee of New York Comic Con if you want to hear our full story I'm going to put up a link right here we were lucky enough to go down and tour the facilities of Google down in New York City last year, and we were part of their awesome program, the Talks at Google, and uh, we did a panel that basically just explains everything about Death Wish Coffee that you guys would want to hear. But why am I telling you all that? Because Death Wish Coffee, like we said, is now the strongest coffee in the galaxy because we just 
were launched into space and are now on the International Space Station. And how did that even happen? That happened right on this very show, the one that you're watching or listening to right now. Last season, last year, we had retired astronaut and artist Nicole Stott on episode 18. I'll put that link up right here, too, if you guys want to go and listen to that episode. It was really cool. We talked to Nicole about living and working on the International Space Station, performing spacewalks, and flying on the space shuttle which was one of the most incredible conversations we've ever had. And that's where, in that interview, it came up that after a spacewalk, that's all she wants is a hot cup of coffee. Yeah, and a we good were like, cup of coffee. That's funny, because we make that. Yeah. You come back in, you've successfully gotten your work done, and... You're exhausted, you want one probably, of, right? You want one of these? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a cup of coffee. <laughs> you know, you want to chill a little bit, yeah. Do you, do you drink coffee in space? Yes, you do. Oh. How, how do we how do we get Death Wish to space? <laughs> how do we? <laughs> you know what? Let's talk about that. I think people okay. would love it. Awesome! So. Great. I am so into that. Awesome. <laughs> we'll, we'll, Jeff and I and you will be responsible for putting Death Wish in space. That's I love amazing. It. And, and so from there, we were able to build a relationship, come up with a plan, and actually execute it. it it's incredible. It's it, it's absolutely incredible. Since we've had Nicole on. We've actually done a lot of science and space stuff on this show. Every single week on our companion show, we do a science segment. And we've had some really fun guests, including Dr. Michio Kaku, where we've talked about science and space exploration as well. And we did a show just recently to celebrate all this, Coffee in Space, episode 77. I'll put that link up here, too, that you guys can check out as well. You know, Jeff, it just goes to show, um, you know, it's one thing that we talk about here a lot. You put something out in the universe, yes. and, it, and it kind of it starts to make manifests itself well that's almost all we talk about here on the on the fueled by death show and death cast is yeah. space we love space space and, nerds for life guys really and because we just were so passionate about it we made this happen yeah for sure. And uh, so that's the backstory for all you guys who are new you guys are all caught up right now you know what's happening and um, I got the absolute honor of being able to go down to NASA and see our coffee launch a space in person. And uh, let's let's recap that right now. All right, Jeff, why don't you lay down the foundation of this journey, your space epic that you had at the NASA Space Center in Florida? Why don't why don't you uh, map everything out for us on how this went down? All right. All right. So um, basically, for a lot of the rocket launches, NASA has been doing this thing called NASA social events. And Anybody, you guys included, can apply to do this. I just applied online, and all they want are two criteria, basically. One, you got to love space, you got to love science, you got to post about it a little bit on your social media. And two, you got to post on your social media. Yeah. Um, you just have to be active on social media. And uh, they choose 40 people for each one of these events, and uh, they get to go down and tour the facility and see a rocket launch live. Again, even not being part of NASA Social, you can go down to something like Cape Canaveral down in Florida, and you can pay a fee. I think it's like 30 or 40 bucks, and you can go to public viewing areas of the rocket launches. That's awesome. And like sit on the, 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 the bleachers and stuff and see it. Which is so, so these types of things are accessible to everybody, which is really cool. NASA's done over 140 of these social events over the last six years. And it's such a great way for all different types of people to come and view this launch. And it was really cool. And you guys are seeing a little bit of uh, when I showed up, I showed up by myself. Yeah. I was all by myself. Didn't know how, anybody. How was that, by the way? It was it was a little nerve wracking because I don't like being by myself. I'm a very social person. So I immediately started, you know, like eyeballing people and trying to go up and like talk to people. <laughs> Everybody knew who I was basically before I even walked up because I'm in Death Wish gear. Yeah. So I'm the I'm the guy with the coffee who's on the rocket. Yeah. You know, so oh, like we awesome. had we had a good rapport as it was going that Thursday, June 28th. I showed up at the old astronaut training experience center, which then became the old astronaut hall of fame which is now basically a storage unit oh. um and uh, we basically met there to get our badges uh check in with the the nasa social um people who were going to be taking us around all day we had to go we had to have dogs sniff yeah, our i was bags. about to ask you how, how was the uh dog sniffing totally process? totally fine you know you just yeah. line up your bags and stuff because we're on a government facility they have to be you know yeah. on the up and up and make yeah. sure everything's good and uh, we went through all that process. We met each other a little bit, and uh, then we boarded the buses to go to the actual facility. But what's great is, is I wanted to tell you, and I haven't actually told you this yet, um, 
15 minutes I was there and I already got kicked out of something. What? <laughs> that didn't take long. Nope. Um, there was this building, where, like I said, is basically a storage unit now. And there was a back room that had a bunch of exhibits that either were in disarray or needed repairing or something like that. You know, yeah. we weren't on the main floor yeah. of all the exhibits. And uh, me and a couple of the other guys kind of walked in the back there to look. And I actually took a picture, which I'll put up for you, of uh, one of the one of the exhibits. And right as I snapped that picture, one of the wonderful people from NASA Social, this this girl comes in and she's like, I hate to be the bad guy, but you guys can't be back here. This is off limits. And I was like, this is amazing. And she's like, why are you so excited? I was like, because I'm already getting kicked out of somewhere. I haven't <laughs> been here for 15 minutes. Well, it sounds like, <laughs> you know what? It sounds like they're so nice there. Even yeah. even working with them to get the coffee in space. Ugh. Did you find that the whole process yeah. were, moved pretty smoothly? Everything moved smoothly. Everybody, like I said, they've done 140 of these events. A lot of these people have been doing them for a long time. Um, they knew their way around everything. They knew how to wrangle 40 different people, you know, yeah. here and there. It was, Everything ran smoothly. It was, it was a dream. And it's crazy because... I've dreamed about doing something like this my whole life, and yet I think of the movie aspect of it. You know, you, like every time you see NASA or like space stuff in movies, people are running around pulling their hair, papers are flying. Yeah. Like, give me those numbers. Buzzers yes. are mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> DEF CON 4, you yeah. know, and it's just like, no, and everything ran smoothly. Everything was fine. The only thing was the weather was a little bit on the iffy side. There was lightning. I'll get that to get to that in a little bit. Um, but the group I was it with, I just got to say, again, was amazing. This uh, group of 40 people was all sorts of different people. Um, there were some students. There were some teachers. There was some people from all different walks of life. There was a, a romance novelist that I met. That's strange. Um, a musician, um, an art, a couple artists, um, some people who worked in the science industry, some people who worked in the space industry, some people who were just social media savvy people, you know, who wow. also are space nerds. Yeah. That was the coolest thing is all 40 of us came from all different walks of life, all different day jobs that we had. So they did a know. pretty good job of like spreading out the uh, the versatility of the group. Uh, of course. But everybody had one thing in common. Love of space. Yeah. And space exploration. So we were just all just so excited to be a part of this event. Oh, and that's, that's so why cool. I can't say enough. Go apply to be one, a part of one yourself. It's really, really fun. Um, so we board the bus, and the first place they take us is basically the block of press. And it's all these trailers right behind the vehicle assembly building, which I'll talk about in a minute. But that's the huge building you see in all the pictures with the big NASA and yeah. the American flag on it. And as we're driving up, you can even see it from miles away because it's so giant wow. and everything's just flat or the ocean do you know right the square there. footage of that facility? yeah i do i do i'll get there i'll all get right, there all right. um but i wanted to talk about the press a little bit what was cool is is they they um got us off the bus and they sequestered us in this one little trailer where we got to meet um the people from nasa social who were running the event and then we got some of the people who were involved in the cargo that was going up on the rocket actually came and talked to us specifically before we actually got to go to the press event. That was really, That's really cool. Really cool. So we got like our own access to that kind of thing. And that was, that alone was a treat for somebody like me because I got to sit there and hear people ask questions. I got to ask some questions. Was too. everybody uh, as excited as you were? Uh, well, you know me. I think I'm a little <laughs> bit more excited than, than people. I, I, I'm a ball of energy and, and things like that. But uh, uh, yes, I think everybody at their core was as excited as, as everybody else because it was we got this opportunity. The first people that we met were two park rangers from the National Trail um, System. And that was kind of a little left field. I was like, they were full park ranger gear, you know, and I was like, why are they here? And they started to explain that this is the 50th anniversary of the National Trail System, and it's also the upcoming 60th anniversary of NASA. And NASA and the National Trail System have actually done a lot together over the decades. So they, want, they, they got their heads together and they wanted to do something exciting um, for, to actually send something up to the International Space Station on this rocket. And uh, without even explaining it, I'll, I'll show you right from the park rangers what I'm talking about. My name is Ashley Danielson. I am a park ranger at the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. It's headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, the Lewis and Clark Trail uh, spans from Wood River, Illinois, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Many of you are probably familiar with Lewis and Clark, right? Lewis and Clark, of course, are the famous ones, but there were lots of other people on the Lewis and Clark expedition. 
And one of them that you may not have known of was a, is a dog, a Newfoundland named Seaman. But uh, Seaman was an important part of the expedition. He, uh, he did many things for Lewis and Clark that helped them. He, uh, he alerted them to danger. He helped save them from a grizzly bear. He was helping with hunting. And uh, he also was a diplomat. So having a, a friendly dog was helpful when they were in, uh, in, in territory that, they, uh, that, was, that was new to the, uh, the United States. Because we had started talking to NASA, and the Park Service has a long history with NASA, the National Park Service, and uh, Alex over here, Alex Pickett, we'll talk about that in a minute. But because we have this long history with NASA, we said, hey, this year is the 50th anniversary of the National Trail System. Lewis and Clark is, of course, a trail. And so what can we do together? And, and we've done several things, but eventually it evolved into this nice little guy here. This is Seaman Jr. And uh, this, is a, this is a replica of, of the real Seaman Jr. There is a Seaman Jr. on the rocket on the mission tomorrow, and he'll be going to the International Space Station and spending the summer on board, doing projects, working, just like the uh, original Seaman. And he is uh, meant to help us celebrate both NASA's 60th anniversary and the 50th anniversary of the National Trail System. So that's adorable. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, and what's funny is that she talked about how they've already gotten flack because we live in the world, we've talked about it on the show before, we live in this world where people only read headlines and people are starting to give uh, the they National... They thought they were shooting dogs into space? <laughs> yeah. Jesus. <laughs> Oh my God, people read. I know, right? Just <laughs> click the article and read. Just read, read the article first read before first you get paragraph. triggered or upset or just get get your shit together. Oh, I was know funny. the facts before I, you get upset. I had no idea that Lewis and Clark had a dog. You, I, that you makes sense. You don't learn that in fifth grade social studies, yeah, though. They just that makes you, sense, yeah, though. Yeah, it totally does. It totally does. So that was really neat. Um, the next group so, of people. So wait, all the astronauts get a little stuffed. No, it's just the one. It's just the uh, little they, stuff done. They, so shot, they shot a dog into space, people. <laughs> they just one dog, though. It was a Newfoundland. It's all right. It's all right. It's okay. It had a name. <laughs> Cecil the Lion. Seaman. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next group of people that came in to talk to us, I was the most excited. And it was the people, we talked about this on this show, that developed the AI that's going to the space station. Oh, called, that creepy... Called Simon. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, so Simon is this, like, floating soccer ball, basically, that is paired they with... should have just the, named it Wilson. I don't know why they're why they're messing around, you know? <laughs> that's true. But uh, it's paired with one of the astronauts in Expedition 56, Alexander Gerst, right now, um, and it's going to hopefully help astronauts in the future with uh, navigation, with mundane day-to-day -day tasks. You look tired, take a pill. And scare the crap out of everybody, for <laughs> sure. But it was really cool because the two guys from Airbus who um, had a hand in developing the technology were there talking about it, and the vice president of IBM um, was there as well because IBM and their Watson AI technology is, is the AI technology in it, in the cloud and all that stuff. So they were all explaining a lot about how this all came to be and it was really really interesting and it was cool because they had the prototype with them too so i got to see that up close and here's a little bit of that right here <laughs> so there are 14 impellers inside this board so we got eight impellers in this direction so we can go quite fast in this direction which is the preferred direction it's quite similar to a human being which just walking straight forward and then we can also knock they shake our heads quite fast, so we, we got a connection to IBM, of course, in case he doesn't agree with something, we can knock, or we can shake our head, so that's quite quite close to human, human beings, actually. Wow. And then we got four impellers in this direction, so we're a little bit slower in this direction, and two impellers in this direction, just to, to, to hold the position in the end. Should I contact the ground station? Technologie so hoch integriert auf, auf 32 cm unterzubringen, das war halt die große Herausforderung. Eine künstliche Intelligenz wie Simon ist wichtig für die Raumstation, weil man diese komplexen Arbeiten letztendlich einfacher ausführen kann. So, ja, yeah, I, I just was so interested in seeing that and i didn't know that they were going to actually have it yeah there yeah. you know like it didn't turn on or anything because they didn't have the battery system in it but it, that was the prototype that they made you know before the one that was packed on the rocket that day and uh, i'm very curious to see how that's going to work once it's up in space well, they're just going to be like wait no this is the good one <laughs> 
Oh, oh no! no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, and another group that came in that talked to us, which I didn't really know a lot about. We talked a little bit on this show actually, but um, was the people behind EcoStress. And EcoStress is basically a, a small device that they're going to be attaching to the outside of the International Space Station. And what it can do is it can map large large areas of the world at a time but it not in hd what it, it's mapping is it's mapping heat signatures specifically to look at water levels mm. in crops so the idea behind this is, is the data they're going to grab from it is going to be able to then be br brought to department of agriculture's around the world and then trickle down to farmers so farmers will know like huge think of huge farms out there in the world it's not just your corn farms or whatever yeah you know huge huge farms out there in the world they'll know oh this part on the grid actually needs more water oh, wow. than the rest of my farm so i'll be able so they'll be able to do, optimize the crop yield i mean the idea is that farming technology and space travel kind of go together especially yes. if we're talking about finding a potential new home that's yes. not going to happen without the most efficient farm growth possible it's the truth and uh so again i got to hear them talk to us you know just us just the nasa social team which was really cool and we got to ask some questions and of course i asked a question about coffee farms. oh nice good we can measure how much water plants use it's called evapotranspiration or et um on the ground or from towers and so um, carries our calval lead and she's linking with towers across the world hundreds of these towers um, and we're linking to make sure what we're seeing from space is what they're seeing from the ground. And so we're kind of doing that in, in past time. But as Carrie said, uh, we'll be delivering these giant uh, data um, deliveries to a public access um, uh, archive so anyone can use it. Uh, but in terms of like the operational side, we're doing it you know, daily. But the deliveries to the public will be in these chunks. So it's pretty big data. That, that's excellent. I, I'm very, very concerned about plants, coffee plants specifically. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, yes. I'm, uh, I'm very happy that it'll be. Right, yeah. Be, I got sent the list of you guys and I saw the coffee. <laughs> and I saw someone else who's like a veggie person. So uh, definitely, um, yeah, I mean, coffee, crops in general, uh, how much water different coffee plants need uh, or different you know vegetables need. Um, and what are their stress points? At what point can you no longer grow that coffee in Guatemala or in Costa Rica? Um, and so we're working with actually Costa Rican um, uh, agricultural extensionists, extension specialists on the, these types of issues. Um, and that's exactly what we want to know as well. Uh, food security, water security, and the, and the livelihood of, of, um, of, of our society. I had to ask about coffee, but it was really cool to hear from the people who are you know, directly responsible for collecting the data from this brand new thing that's on the International Space Station that's eventually going to be helping coffee farmers. I, it blows my mind even saying something like that. Yeah, it's so intense. So intense. All right, so press day, awesome. You got your coffee questions in. Yeah. Where'd you go after that? Well, they started to do a tour, give us a tour of the facility, which was cool. They took us on a bus tour all around, and it's, it's miles, miles and miles and miles and miles wow. of facility. And... Uh, they took us around and, and showed us some of the buildings and some of the different uh, labs on the complex, which was really, really interesting. Even to the fact, like, we drove by, like, the administration buildings, you know, and they were like, this is where literal decisions are made, you know, like, in that, and it's just an office building, but it really resonates with you. You're like, holy crap, that's where, like, you just open up the window and go, coffee in space, guys, coffee in space. <laughs> yes, I should Did you think about that yet? Uh. Coffee in space. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first building they took us to, was the vehicle assembly building. And I can't stress enough the magnitude of this building. It, 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 I, I couldn't even fathom it. Just being near it, it's giant. And you asked me um, square footage. earlier about, about, about the, uh, the footage of it. And I don't have square footage. It covers eight acres. It's 520 feet tall, and it's 518 feet wide. It's the largest one-story building in the world. In the world. It's, it's one story. It's one story. That's because it's you say, hollow. Two hundred and five hundred and twenty feet tall. Five feet tall. Two, wow. Yeah, it's giant. This was opened in 1965, and what's even more incredible about this is when we were allowed to step inside of it, and we're inside this building, the history hits you in the face. 
every major rocket system and up to and including the space shuttle have been constructed and assembled in this building. Wow. And right now, the brand new SLS rocket, which will be taking the Orion spacecraft into orbit with humans again, is being constructed in this building. Wow. That's it's, incredible. It's incredible. That's um, like a it's a space church. It is a space church. Um, and I'm putting up some some video and some some photos of this. Just the sheer magnitude, and I'll show you, show you this photo that I'm showing Dustin right here, of oh, from from the, wow. the ceiling to the ground is that incredible. That makes sense why it would need to be 500 feet tall. Because that's a rocket in that cutout. Oh, my which God. Is, which is incredible. The large, Some other facts about it, which is crazy. The largest American flag in the world is painted on the side of it. That The American flag reaches 209 feet tall and 110 feet wide. Wow. Yeah. And the crawlers that transport the rockets from the vehicle assembly building yeah. or the VAB building to the launch pads are some of the largest machines ever to move on land, ever. Whoa. And I'll talk about those in, in, in a little bit because we actually got to see them up close. But the crawler transporter, two has been modified to support that SLS rocket. And it, is a, and it has been modified to carry 18 million pounds Whoa. to and from this one this vehicle bed. one vehicle it's wow. crazy massive and we had one of the coolest guides ever he has been part of nasa for the better part of the last three decades and told us some incredible stories and some incredible facts and figures about this building and i'm going to play you some highlights of that right now because i just i can't get enough of him and his knowledge of this incredible building Anyway, if you look at the openings up on the 16th floor where the yellow rails are for the crane there, there, look how big that opening is. When we get down here, that right there determined how big we got the orbiter's wing. Believe it or not, this building determined the size of the thing. We couldn't modify this building anymore. It was originally built for the Soap Shuttle, I mean for the Apollo program. They used it, and when we, we got it, we played with it a little bit more, we used it for the thing. That was their clean room in there. And I was telling you about the guys smoking. Well, we thought we had talked to them and told them, when you smoke, you've got to go outside the fence. So you come off the, the, where they had their, uh, their slug at, their adapter module. And I was up on top there, and the guy said, well, I want to tell the interpreter he wanted to go smoke a cigarette. And I said, sure, go downstairs, get the guy, take you outside the gate, smoke cigarettes, and come back. I didn't realize what he had not understood what I said, so I turned around, I smelled cigarette smoke. He's down here in the corner, feet propped up, and he lit one of those nasty Russian cigarettes up. And I mean, it's like smoking rope, guys. Uh, I mean, you guys, kids, when you were young, ever smoked grapevine or rope or something like that, trying to be Mr. Cool. Well, that's what it smells like. <laughs> it was bad. So it was like everybody had heart attacks and everything. So we finally got that stopped and everything. If you look at the building, right, the, the, the line down the middle, this is where the, the orbiter was drug in here. Um, when they brought it in here, we picked it up, turned it about a 45 degree angle, and it, it held there for about four hours. You get the swing out of it. Then we'd move it up and move it over here. The time it left the floor, that was called hard down, was bolted up the tank, it took about 24 hours, three, literally 24 hours straight to get it from point A to point B up there. So, that's the me wall. That's every guy that, that all, about 99% of the people that worked on the shuttle program um, signed the wall and everything. If you guys want to walk over close to it, take pictures, go right ahead. If you want to come out here and make a film, they'll do it. That's the Men in Black 3 was filmed out here. Um, 
Armageddon was filmed out here. Um, there's about two or three more out here. And then the really, really, really cheesy one was uh, Sharknado. <laughs> <laughs> I was in it. <laughs> I was serious. That was such a low budget film. It was funny. And it was only, they only brought the, the one guy out here. He had a camera about like this one right here, and that's all it was filmed with. Um, and the two or three actors, and they were using us, people that were escorting them around, as extras. And it was like, keep your mouth shut. So another guy and myself, we were up in the flight crew area, and you see a guy's head down like this, and I'm cracking up laughing. I'm putting these boots on. <laughs> So I'm, I'm on the screen for probably about a total of about three and a half seconds. <laughs> but I made the big screen. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, that was literally one of the most incredible buildings I've ever stepped foot in. Well, it's one of the most incredible buildings that's ever existed. Yeah. It, the history, like I said, like knowing that some of the the, the rockets and space shuttles and, and, and thing, Mir, the, the space station, was some of those pieces were built in there. Like, it's... I, I was I, I was in awe. The I whole can't time. imagine. I have this belief that buildings tend to soak up everything that's happened inside of them, and you can almost feel it when you're in them. Like when you go to landmarks or when you go to these giant churches, you can almost feel the, yes. the epicness that has happened in those walls. And I can't imagine. It must have been such a strange feeling walking in there, like nothing else, because there is no other building like that anywhere ever. I mean, maybe the Russians have something like that Close. over in Russia. Yeah. But f as far as American history, as far as yeah. our history yep. as United States citizens, yeah. there's nothing more intense than that building that you just walked into. Yeah, yeah it was it was incredible. So then we get loaded back on the bus, and uh, we got to tour around, and we got to see where the tracks are, where these crawlers go from the ve the vehicle assembly building to the different lines. I mean, it pads. must be a weird giant highway of it some is. sort. Yeah. It is, because it takes hours and hours and hours for these crawlers just to go a yeah, mile. Yeah, they call it a crawler. They don't call it yeah. a speedster, you know? Yeah. Um, it's carrying 18 million goddamn pounds. It's, it's going to go slow. It's it's incredible. And we got to see the the modified crawler transporter, too. Um, which I'm going to be showing. You so guys they like retrofitted it for the next rocket ship it needs to tell. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. It's 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 then they're still testing it out. Um, that that crawler is actually over 50 years old, but the the improvements that they made on it, it should go another 50 years now. Yeah, well, it's not like you're buying a Ford truck off the lot. These right. things were engineered specifically to do this task and do it well. Right, and. Um, the the crawler too. Just I wanted to give you a little bit of perspective because it's a little hard to see in this video, but um, it is the size of a baseball infield. It is wow. giant. It's giant. Wow. And uh, um, it also is about six point six million pounds. This is what the crawler weighs. Wow. And to put that into perspective, that's uh, fifteen Statue of Liberties. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's pretty nuts. And what's cool is is uh. You'll see when we get to the launch pads, the launch pads are angled, and the crawler actually has hydraulics that allows it to angle so the rocket that's on it is always level. Yeah, it doesn't no bottom what. out on yep, the ramp. It's always level when it goes up that yeah. ramp. So that's you really don't spill any fuel right. <laughs> on the highway. Right. Um, you and only make that mistake once. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's what's really neat about that. And then we got to see uh, launch pad 39B, which is um, very, very... Very cool. 39B and 39A are very historic. Lots of launches have went off of them. 39B is the launch pad that is now being um, fitted to be able to hold the SLS rocket with the Orion spacecraft on it. And we got to see the brand new flame trench, and I'm going to show you guys some of that video as well. What's cool about the flame trench is, like I said, it's brand new, so there's no flames have touched it. So we got to see it in its most pristine condition, and no one will ever see it like that ever again. That's a great band name. Yeah. <laughs> By the way. <laughs> Flame Trench, Tonight Live. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, um, some facts about the Flame Trench, there are 96,000 individual bricks laid down on 450 feet of this Flame Trench with a steel... Um, the flame deflector at the end of it, and that flame deflector is 150. Ooh, another good band name. Yes, it is. <laughs> 150 steel 
um, plates, each weighing uh, over 4,000 pounds. Wow. And this is supposed to be able to contain the flames from the SLS rocket. It, sh- it can contain up to uh, 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit, which is incredible, incredible. And I'm showing you some of that there. And there's some, some good uh, footage of our um, a- another one of our awesome guides giving us a little bit more about the flame trench in here, right here. Um, but here, you can, if you look down here, you can see a nice view down the flame trench. If you were here on launch day, you cannot last long. Um, the deflectors, see that's, and then all the exhaust will come down that way and be directed right at us. So the, the deflector that we have here was optimized for the SLS, but it has been designed so that it can support any rocket out here. Uh, there's about 96,000 bricks that went in the wall. Uh, it took us about two years to complete. Each brick is about 25 pounds. It was really cool to see the flame trench up close and to see some of these launch pads um, because the launch pads themselves are a technological innovation, you know, like yeah. to be able to contain the thrust from a rocket that's going to space. Well, it's weird. You think about, you know, you think about the rocket, you think about the space station when it comes to when it comes to space travel but what you don't think about is the other technologies on the ground that make this happen yeah like the flame trench yeah and and the crawler i mean these are works of technological art that nobody even hears about or no nobody even thinks about when it comes to it but it has to be state-of-the-art like futuristic technology it's incredible man And speaking of futuristic technology, the next place we were able to go to was a place called Swamp Works. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to take any video or photos in this place because this is the place that they're developing the brand new rover technology and different technologies for Mars and moon missions. Um, And, uh, you know, they want to keep some of it under wraps. and I understand that. But I did get two photos, and I think that's really neat that one of them, what it was is, is it's this structure, and you can see it right here, that professional sandcastle people made for NASA. It's it's a little worn for wear right now um, because of the uh, the recent uh, weather that Florida's seen. But what's interesting about this is it stands right outside of Swamp Works. What's interesting about this is it's made from synthetic lunar dirt. Um, for a very long time, the Swamp Works was creating their own lunar dirt because they're trying to test these rovers that they want to use on the moon, but they yeah. want to make sure that they can work on lunar material. Yeah. But they were saying it's very, very um, expensive to make that. Yeah. Recently, they found a type of basalt out west. I believe it was in Utah or Arizona um, in the deserts out there, maybe Nevada. They found this type of basalt that's 80 percent the same as lunar dirt. Oh, wow. So they were able to add just a little bit to it at a much cheaper cost. And now they have this lunar dirt. And they made I got one photo of this this facility. This is what they laughed about. They said if we were to have faked the moon landing. This is where we would have done it. And this is a huge, gigantic box that they built and filled with this synthetic lunar dirt where they test these different rovers in there to see, you know, like wh- it, how they can perform in this type of material. And that big boulder in the background, that's actually hollow, but it's got the lunar dirt around it. And it's like used to see if the, d- the, the different rovers, if they can manipulate it or move it around or grasp onto it. You know, it's like a di- it's like a another test thing that they have in there, which is really, really interesting. How do they do that with um, like uh, adding in that that uh, gravity that they're dealing with? They or? don't do it with that. Yeah. That's a different facility, different okay. kind of thing. This is just to really test that. They also test spacesuits in there to see if they can withstand with the dust and the dirt and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, one of the rovers that they were working on is actually learning how to take um, the lunar dirt and kind of scoop it up and then deposit it into a refinery, and then it was going to take the chemical composition out of it, the water out of it, and then use that and make fusion out of it. So the thought would be is to take a rover like that, send it to the moon or to Mars, get it to get this dirt, process it and by the time your rocket with you inside of it gets to the moon or mars you have fuel already waiting for you to get home oh wow yeah and then we could set up almost like um way stations home, yeah like yeah. home bases to refuel as we as we go deeper and deeper into space really really neat the other wow. thing that they were working on was 3d printing yeah but 3d printing with this material and they're working on it uh, in conjunction with the U.S. Army, and they've actually come up with a, a process now that is what they were saying many times more durable and stronger than concrete. So, just to give a little bit of backstory, the idea is that 
we send a 3D printer into space that can make the tools and things that we need when we get there instead of sending a bunch of supplies. Not even just the tools, the structures. If we were to want to build a structure on, let's say, the moon, it would cost a lot of money to be able to burn the fuel to take bags of concrete to the moon. Yeah. But if we can just make concrete out of what's already on the moon, we're, we're already there. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. That's crazy. It was really cool to be in that. And these guys, it was a small team in there, but they were just science nerds all the way, you know? Like, they really enjoyed their job and just, they're figuring out problems in space every single day. They go to work and just do that. So cool. Then the next place we got to go was a place called the Veggie Labs. And Veggie Labs deals with Veggie, which is the system on the International Space Station right now, which allows the astronauts to grow crops in zero G. And they've done it on the International Space Station. They grew lettuce, and some of the astronauts actually ate the lettuce that they grew. They probably loved it after eating all that dried food. Exactly. A fresh vegetable in space. Yeah. Like, oh, my gosh. That's so incredible. And um, uh, so we got to tour their facility. It was really cool seeing, like, the different setups. They're working on growing peppers and tomatoes in space. Mm. Um, They're working on kale, um, dragon lettuce, all these different things. We got to see the different environments. And, uh, again, really eye-opening with that kind of stuff. And uh, I have a little bit of a clip of uh, some of the guys from there, too, because, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about coffee. What are your thoughts about growing coffee in space? Coffee? (laughs) I I want to grow coffee. Actually, my wife wants to buy a bunch of coffee trees in my yard right now in Merritt Island. So, very (laughs) pro-coffee. Uh, is it know, viable at all at this point? Or what's that? Is it viable at all to grow a crop like that in space at this point? Or are we still working towards that? You know, the big thing is that our, our growing areas right now, you know, veggies about this tall. Yeah. APA is about this tall. Yeah. Um, you know, we've done work with dwarf plums, which, you know, small dwarf plums that were genetically modified by the USDA to just continuously pump out fruit. So it is something we could do. We don't have the hardware yet up there for it, but. Down the road, we're talking transit missions to and from Mars, surface systems. Having small trees would be ideal. Yeah. And coffee, yeah. Uh, they smell great, beautiful flowers. You know, Excellent. Coffee. Excellent. It was really neat talking with those guys about growing crops because, I mean, we're going to have to do that. I mean, we talked about that with Dr. Michio Kaku about yeah. growing crops on Mars, and we're going to have to learn how to do these types of things, the, the stress that these plants are going to you know, retain and that kind of stuff. Um, it was very, very interesting, eye-opening again. You know, and it was one of those places I knew we were going to, and I was like, I wonder what this is going to be like. And I yeah. left being like, that was incredibly amazing. Um, finally, um, that day, we got to go into the launch pad with the Falcon 9 rocket. That's so cool. Um, and it was laying down on its side. I'm showing you guys some video of it as we're talking right here. It was incredible. We got to get out of the bus, go up to the gate, and see it laying down. And just knowing that our coffee was in that rocket, you know, feet away from me, and knowing that that rocket was going to be in space in less than 12 hours. Oh, man. It was incredible to see in person from, you know, as close as I possibly could be to it. It was it was really nuts, um, which then, you know, we broke for the day. They brought us back, and... And I went back to my hotel room only thinking about one thing. I'm going to wake up early and that rocket's going to go to space. That was, I I still, I still can't believe that I got to witness what I got to witness. And some of the people that were part of this NASA social event, they are from the area. They've gotten to see lots of different launches. Um, But uh, it was incredible. We got to go to the NASA Causeway and set up our cameras about three and a half miles away from the launch pad, and that's the closest you can get to a launch pad before a launch. So we got to see it the closest you can possibly see. Um, And, uh, you know, we were there probably about an hour before, maybe 45 minutes before, you know, so we were anticipating and getting ready, making sure all of our shots are are lined up. And and it was funny. I I had the cam, our, our main camera going, trained on the launch pad, with our Zoom audio recorder going on top of it. And then I had my phone out in my left hand doing Facebook Live. Wow. Beaming back to you guys back at Death Wish HQ and, and the world. We had, we, had pe- we had over 100 people watching the Facebook Live the whole entire time from all over the world. Egypt, Sweden, Alaska, Australia, um, Israel, like everywhere was, was watching with us, watching our coffee That's go so into cool. space, which was crazy. But I'm sitting there like this 
phone in one hand, the the tripod arm in the other hand, and I'm not looking at either of them. I'm just looking at the rocket and desperately trying to maneuver both of these <laughs> as it's going up. It was it was a little tough, but I I, I did all right. Gaining I did all new right. skills every day, Jeff. And gaining new skills every day. You did great. Um, thanks. I want to uh, show you guys. Um, some of that footage I've been showing you as we've been talking, but I want to show you some of the launch footage um, from our cameras and from NASA and SpaceX of the Falcon 9 launching into space. Here we go, guys. Oh, are you excited? Nine. Excited? Eight, eight seconds. Oh, my gosh. Seven, six, six five, four, four three, three, all eyes three, on. Two. I'm going to cry. Oh, there it goes. We have ignition oh and liftoff. Oh, my gosh. Oh my god. Wow. Holy snow. Oh, that looks scary. Here it comes. Here it First of all, the sound yeah. was epic when it was rocketing towards me. Like it was, I, it was just I never experienced something like that before. But. Yeah, the the look of just like it's it's uh, you know dawn, yeah. right? And, yeah, and it's dark, and all of a sudden it's daytime. Daylight. Yeah, like, as bright as the sun, and it looks like a sun ripping through the sky. And it comes, it comes. Up in the sky, but because you know the curve of the Earth, like it plays tricks on your on your brain, because it comes, uh, it goes straight up, but it's coming towards you, so it's coming towards us. That's why the sound's getting louder and louder and louder, and then it banks to go into the atmosphere. Yeah. But because it's so high now in the atmosphere and the Earth is rotating, it actually looks like it's falling. Oh. Because it's that far away. You know what I mean? Creepy. Like it's, yeah. So it's it's really really cool and. We got to see, you couldn't really see on uh, my video, but we got to see when the Falcon 9 separated from the dragon, you could see the tiniest dot of light fall to the earth as the dragon is still going away, you know, because that's the rocket coming coming away from it. And uh, when the separation happened and the smoke was, was hitting the atmosphere, um, the sun came up at that exact moment, and it hit the smoke. And I'm showing you guys some, some of the pictures and video from that as well. And I've never seen it look like someone painted the sky. Yeah, I was saying that when we were here. Yeah, you know, looking at all this this feed coming back from that launch, and I was showing everybody that picture of the sun rising and the smoke, and it 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 did. It, it looked, looked like Photoshop. It looked like a painting. It was incredible. And I talked to everybody who was part of NASA Social who have seen multiple multiple launches. I even talked to that day some uh, some of the astronauts at NASA Sp Space Center. Um, and everybody said the same thing. They had never seen a launch. Come on, they always like say that. that. No, like they were 100% <laughs> wow. true. They've never seen, because it was that perfect second. The smoke hitting oh, right. and the sun coming up 
never seen one where it, it hit that perfect second. Before. Somebody should definitely paint that. It oh looks my amazing. It was incredible. And I mean, I got some good footage of it. I know some of the people from NASA Social that I was down there with were professional videographers and yeah. photographers. They got some really cool stuff. But you brought it up. I want to throw it back um, to up here, which was crazy. At the same time, I'm down there desperately trying to manipulate a couple cameras and watching it with my own eyes. You guys are throwing a party in, in HQ which we were like, this would be fun to do, and you know, yeah. obviously the employees will show up. I kept on pushing. Time. I was like, come on, we gotta, we gotta celebrate this. This yeah. is an amazing. Our coffee's thing. going to space. Yeah, and we thought, you know, we'd open that up to the public. Uh -huh. And our thought was, hey, it's five o'clock in the morning. Yeah, we don't expect to see a lot of people, right. or we just kind of want to do it. And all of a sudden, like, there was a hundred and something people 100 here. hundred and something people here. Yeah, right in our middle warehouse out there. You guys couldn't even keep up serving coffee, you were telling me? Yeah, so let me tell you my yeah, perspective of this story. Because now it starts at five. Yep. And I, from my knowledge, the, the rocket launches at 526. It was, was 542, this, actually. Which is when it actually launched, right. which was great. Oh, you thought it was 526. Right. Okay. And... I got here at 5.30, so I was rushing here. Oh, no. And I was sweating. I was like, I just got a new dog, so I had to let it out. It's right. It takes yep. its fucking time. You, so You have a dog. You have a responsibility, yo. <laughs> so it set me back like 10 minutes. And so I rushed here. The car's everywhere in the parking lot. I find a parking spot, right? Like, I park in front of the podcast store because nobody right. else is parking there. Right, and right. I know I can get away with it. Yeah. And I rush in the, the back way like I usually do by my desk. And I come in the back way. And walk out, and there's I see a hundred people and four news crews, and I'm standing next to Mike, and he slaps me on the back, and he goes, "Dustin will take care of it." Oh no! <laughs> and as he says that, there's a guy hooking me up with an earpiece and a microphone through my shirt, and he goes, "You're gonna be live in 30 seconds." I first of all, it was early in the morning. Yep. I did not expect to be on the news. Nope. And then I go, I could use a cup of coffee first, and I'm like, we're actually. I, Mike said, he's like, nope, you can't have any. We're oh out. And I was like, you're kidding me, right? He's like, no, I'm not. Actually. And you know how Mike jokes. I yeah. thought he was just messing with me. Nope, no coffee, nothing. Wow. Just like bare bones. You did a great job thanks, on the news. Thanks, man. I know, you know, if I, I can, I can sing some of it in as, yeah. to here as well. But the coffee's really great for like reboosting that uh, mental fatigue issue. And, you know, the first the first interview was a little bit nerve wracking, especially when you have that. I didn't know this, that you're wearing the earpiece yep. and they're telling you, all right, they're going to ask you questions. Yep. Uh, you're going to hear the producer talking to you to, to yep. set you up for everything. And I hear the producer talking to me, but it's going over the live news feed. Right. So it's just a mess of noise in my right ear and 100 people talking on my left ear. Right. It, it, it was a little bit it was a little bit nerve wracking, but I was like, I've done this before. I go live all the time here. Yeah. Just take a deep breath. And we're good. And yeah, I felt like I did an okay job. I could hear what they were saying. I um, I felt myself like start to like, I didn't babble yet. Yeah. But I was like, I know when my mind starts to babble and yeah. I, I'm, I pulled it back immediately. And then every interview after that was just smooth. It was fine. So, so talk to me because I know what I felt standing on the causeway watching this rocket, rocket to space with our coffee inside of it. Um, what was it like? What what it was it like here when it finally launched and everybody's watching it on TV and uh, you know you guys are all in in the place with our coffee as yeah. you're watching this rocket? What was what what did it feel like? Well, for personally for me, I felt numb. Yeah, with just so much everything going on and the interviews and just the the magnitude of what we've accomplished. Yeah. and you ca it's just so big you can't feel it. Yeah. And I felt nothing for a while, <laughs> for a while. And then after people started to clear out a little bit and I got a little coffee in me and, and I had some time to think about it and reflect on it. Yeah. And it was just a rush of endorphins and emotions and just, uh, just achievement. Yeah. That I've never felt before. Oh, it, it's, I, I'm with you, man. And we, we were feeling the same thing couple yeah. thousand miles away like it was uh, you and i have been a part of this story since its inception and again like i said at the beginning we never even knew it was a story yeah and uh who, and, who knows how many stories we have going on in uh, the background right now i i just i i couldn't i couldn't believe i couldn't believe that it that we were able to do it couldn't believe that it happened and then a couple days later um after flying around the earth for a while um the dragon capsule was captured by the iss and the, the, the crew of Expedition 56 
has since unpacked the capsule and hopefully are enjoying our coffee in space right now. And I actually, I've got some footage of that uh, so you guys can see what the Dragon capsule looked like in space and what it looked like when the big arm came out and, and captured it. It's really crazy. It has to be very careful and slowly bring the capsule in, making sure that no debris is in between the capsule and the, the connector. And then when it finally connects, and it's 16 steel bolts have to be drilled into the, the connection so it's there. So yeah. then when they undo the airlock, it doesn't blow away, yeah. you know, like a science fiction My movie. Coffee. Yeah, exactly. Um, and to end this journey, I wanted to bring up the one person who made it all possible, and that is retired astronaut and artist Nicole Stott. Um, we had, like I said, I had her on this show for the first time ever I got to meet her in person. Um, right after the, the launch happened, she gave me a call because her and her family were down there um, for Asteroid Day, which happened to be the same day. Huh. And uh, they had just watched the launch. And I didn't. I didn't know what to expect. They took me in like one of their own. They picked me up, and uh, we uh, drove me to Cape Coral, which is this awesome surf town right on the right on the water. There, we went to this amazing, amazing breakfast spot. Had breakfast and coffee, which was awesome. Talked about science and comic books and space and um, all sorts of cool stuff. In fact, I want to tell you a fun story. Uh, when we were in the Veggie Lab. Uh, they were talking about sending fresh produce and vegetables up to the astronauts and how they request things from time to time. Yeah. And one of the things that they said that they don't like is bananas because apparently they make the space station smell. Ah. And you can't open a window, so when you have something that smells in the space station, it smells forever. Ah. I brought this up to Nicole at breakfast. I was like, so, like, do you ever remember, like, being on the space station and having some, someone eat, like, something like a banana? She's like, I don't remember a banana. But she said the first time she was up there, one of her crew members requested, and you guys have probably all seen this, a pickle in a bag. Yep, pickle <laughs> in a bag. And you see them at truck stops. It's a literal pickle in a bag. It's a with giant juice, pickle. It's a giant pickle. It's it, like a right? one pound pickle. And she explained that anything that you open, you have to consume all of it. Okay. And she explained that uh, one of the favorites of a lot of astronauts are um, shrimp cocktail. But they didn't really like opening up a shrimp cocktail because it comes with this huge packet of sauce. And nobody wanted to sit there sucking down marinara oh, you sauce. Because you have to eat it all. Or it'll go bad and it'll sink up everything. So they made a, she told a funny story how they made a pact if they ever ate shrimp it's cocktail. Co cocktail sauce, by the way. Right, cocktail sauce, yeah. If they ever opened up a shrimp cocktail sauce, a couple of them would split the sauce. Like, this is your third of sauce. This is your third of sauce. This Whoa. is your third of sauce. Could eat it. So cut back to this guy with his bag of pickle. He opens up the pickle, and they all split the pickle because they're eating a bag pickle, which is a treat, you know, I'm sure, yeah, on the International yeah. Space Station. And then he decides to um, soak up all the juice in a towel, and then he hangs the towel from, like, one of the fixtures in the space station because you have to hang anything that's wet, any of your sweat, you know, rags, anything like that. You hang it, and then the water very slowly evaporates. The, the moisture very slowly evaporates. So this gre bright neon green towel hung there for days with Dude, pickle juice. Just drink the pickle juice. <laughs> no, what are you so doing? She said that it smelled like pickles for days. They sent him two of them, and they wouldn't allow him to open the other bag. <laughs> Unless you drink the fucking pickle <laughs> yeah. juice. What are you doing? It was pretty funny. But Amateur they, move, astronaut. Amateur move. But they brought me around after that, the Kennedy Space Center, which you can go, and I highly recommend if you go down to Cape Canaveral to go. Um, I'm going to show you guys some video as we're talking about this. It was incredible. Um, Nicole's husband, Chris, and her son took me around the rocket garden, which is um, rockets throughout the ages of, that we've sent up and, and basically gave me my own guided tour around this because of the knowledge that this family has because they've been in it for so long. Right, like, right. They were showing to me some of the capsules and stuff, you know, like, and there were pictures of the astronauts that were there, and he was... He exclaiming, you know, like, oh, yeah, I knew him. And, you know, like I and like they used to tell me stories about being in this exact capsule that's in front of me. Yeah. And, yeah. And it was incredible to do that. And I also walked around and saw um, the the Hall of Heroes, which is the, the astronaut um, Hall of Fame, basically, which is an incredible experience. I definitely recommend. And then finally, 
um, the space shuttle Atlantis, which um, I'm again going to show you some of the video of that. Um, what's incredible is, is they usher you into this main room. And they show you a video that's very well produced about the inception of the space shuttle. The space shuttle was an idea in the late 60s, and it took over a decade to come to be able to figure out how the hell are we going to make this work? A reusable manned shuttle system to space and back. How the hell is does that even possible? And um, you watch this video and you're in awe. And then they usher you in this other room and the walls and the ceiling and the floor and everything is a screen. And it's like one of those cool amusement park rides where like you're watching the space shuttle and then you're in the space shuttle and then you're outside of the space shuttle in space. You know what I'm talking Did about. Did Kevin like, Bacon narrate it? Yeah, no, it was na <laughs> no narration. Right. It was just like a sensation of the idea of the space shuttle rocketing to space, being in space and coming back down. It was incredible. And then the screen went clear. And as the screen went clear, you realize it's a door. And the door opens up, and the actual space shuttle Atlantis Whoa. is right in front of you. And like, I'm tearing up a little bit just talking about it. It, it like, I, My heart got into my throat because this thing that's flown so many times and so many miles, um, 33 missions, 156 people, in, and it's in front of me. It's been in space, and it's been in front of me, and I can walk all around it. There was tons of exhibits. tons of. I spent two hours in this building. Um, just just talking to people, reading the exhibits, being able to see it's at an angle like it would be in space with its bay doors open and its arm out, just like it would be in space. It's, it was breathtaking to be. And that's kind of how I wanted to end this is that, yes, it was an incredible journey for us to get our coffee on a rocket and go to the International Space Station. But the journey is space exploration. Mm -hmm. We need to keep this in the conversation. Yes. I keep talking about that. That's why we talk about it on this show yeah. so much. That's why I champion people like Michio Kaku and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and NASA and SpaceX and these people who make sure that it's in the conversation. We need to be an interplanetary species. We need to keep space exploration in the minds and hearts of everybody. 561 people to this day have been in space since the dawn of humanity. That is nothing. Yeah, that's absolutely nothing. 38 countries, 29,000 man days have been sent in, spent in space. That's over 77 years total from all the people in that and all wow. the time, all the incredible stuff that they've done in space. 135 space shuttle launches happened. And we're hopefully going to be making another craft that's reusable that will be bringing people to and from space. April 12th, 1981, the same year I was born, was the first space shuttle mission ever. And then July 21st, 2011 was the last. Um, it's one of the most incredible feats of humanity ever outside. And, oh, I forgot. I actually have a photo. This is the photo that you walk into. This is the actual. That's the Atlantis right there wow. um it, the space shuttle is incredible it docked at the iss 12 times that just just this one just to atlantis wow docked the iss 12 times i think it docked at mir of uh, almost that that amount of times um the iss itself has been in space since 1998 and people have been living and working in the international space station for 17 years 17 years we've been we've been a space faring society and we need to keep doing that we need to keep going to space we need to keep exploring new worlds exploring everything that's out there um i can't thank people like nicole stott enough for also doing her part for instilling this into people for she was part of that one strange rock she did a she did an incredible speech at Kennedy when I was there, and they showed her episode of One Street oh, Rock cool. on the big screen. Yeah. It was incredible. Um, finally, I want to show you, she gifted me. All those, um, yeah. With her actual mission patches, and I'll put these up in the uh, uh, photos in, the, in this episode. Um, these are actual mission patches that were worn on, uh, you know, on her spacesuit for her shuttle missions. She spent over 100 days in space. She flew on the space shuttle. Um, this one is the most special um, because it was the final mission of the space shuttle discovery. Um, and, uh, and it was, you know, it means a lot in the history of humanity of what we were able to achieve with things like the space shuttle and the international space station. And again, it's, it's incredible to be the smallest, tiniest part of that history. You and yeah. I 
yeah. are part of that history. You out there are part of that history. We as a human species are. Well, if you think about it, space travel is the ultimate fueled by death, it right? Really Not is. as a death as a single person, but death as a species. Yes. Eventually, eventually, no matter how you dice it up, we're not going to be able to live on this planet anymore. Never. And if we're not prepared for that, we will no longer have our species. It'll be the death of our species. Yes. So, you know, Death Wish Coffee and space travel, ultimate combination. Ultimate combination. Um, support your local science, your, ste your, your STEM, your STEAM, your CS for Alls. Support your facilities. Tour these facilities. Go to museums. The National, the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington D.C. actually has the Space Shuttle Discovery, the one that Nicole flew on. Mm -hmm. It has that in there. If you go to Cape Canaveral and uh, go to Kennedy Space Center, you can see Space Shuttle Atlantis in person. You can tour these facilities. You can see launches live. Tell people about it. Follow NASA on social media. Follow SpaceX. Be excited about it. It's the next evolution of human existence, and it's exciting, and it's imaginative, and it's awesome, and it's so cool to be a part of. I'm gonna say it. Cheers, everybody. This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Death Wish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening.